Hey everybody, this is John Jay and thanks for joining me. Um, I just want to share some things with you. Yeah, a little bit of personal stories, but I want to work that, weave that together with some of the work I've been publishing now. So today's Saturday and I've been, I just finished a, a list of things, okay, some cases. And I want to share a couple of stories with you because it occurred to me, <clears throat> maybe this is an important message. So personal stories, two, I have to tell you two stories to make this, to create, I want to create a metaphor for what I'm explaining here. Let me just, let me just preface everything by, the example I'm going to use is an article I just published called Impugning the State Bar. And if you don't have it, <clears throat> please ask me for it by email. I don't mind sending out lots of times. Please send it to everybody. And it goes along with what I'm about to tell you. <clears throat> um, when I was little, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. My brother was a year younger than me. And uh, one time we were like probably 11 or something or 12. And my brother and I beat up this kid. And we did stuff like that. But this time it was <clears throat> it was a bad situation. So the kid goes home and he was our friend. I mean, it's just, that's what we did, you know. So the kid goes home and tells his mom, I mean, <clears throat> if I were him, I'm not faulting him for that. He did that, no problem. So his mom, in this fit of panic, calls my mom. <laughs> she didn't call the police. She calls my mom because that, this is what we did back then. And she, you know, she told the story. And so my mom was beside herself. She was so apologetic and she didn't know what to do. And she, and she then <clears throat> waited till my dad got home from work and told him about it. And he got home seven or eight, whatever. And we ate dinner that late because we ate dinner whenever he got home. So after that, after the dust cleared, so to speak, he took us aside and <clears throat> he asked us about the story. What happened? Why do we beat up this kid? And he, he wanted to explain what happens when you behave that way, when you use violence and you hurt somebody. Um, so he took us to the police. He took us to the jailhouse in Tampa, Florida. I'll never forget. <clears throat> and there was a, a police officer at the door, you know, he's like the guard and you had all these uh, people in their jail cells. And this was like, I guess the staging area It's not really the jailhouse that you live in, but there were prisoners there, 20 to 30 of them. So he explained to the police officer why he was there and the cop was really interested. He want, my dad wanted to show us, my brother and I, what happens to people that break the law, that use violence to hurt others and why it, it's a crime. And he wanted us to, it, he wanted to be palpable <laughs> and it was, I hated going there. I was, I was terrified. My brother was, we were speechless for the type of kids we were. <laughs> We were speechless that night. It was like 10 o'clock at night. And he, the police officer walked us through. He gave us a tour. And he said, this guy's here because whatever he did. And my dad's in the background. He didn't do anything. And so this cop's walking us through. And we're like, oh, my God. We, we can't wait till this is over. So so my 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 dad, he, he just showed us that this is not how you behave. You don't use violence and break the law. And you don't have the right to do that. And so what better lesson to get when you're 12 or 10 instead of getting it when you're 25, right? Now, I'm saying that story to preface what I'm going to tell you. Now, my dad is from, he was from Ohio, born in 46, and he grew up in a, in, in a school. He grew up going to school, the public school there, where every day there was a gang war, and he was getting involved with the mafia as a child, a young child, because he was being paid to deliver things for the, you know, the mafia. And uh, once you're in with them, then at some point you can't get out. And he knew that. Uh, so he moved to Florida. He always says he moved here and he came here on vacation and never left. But the truth is he wanted to get away from the mafia. So this is the, this is the kind of history my dad had. He was not a tough guy. I'm not a tough guy. It's just what, what it was. So anyways, he took us on that lesson, that tour of the jail it, it always stuck in my mind, as you can imagine. I'm 55 now, so I never forgot. This. <clears throat> Soon thereafter, like within a couple of years, there was a situation. I can't remember what it was. My brother was always bad mouth, big mouth, creating problems. And I tried to stay away. I wasn't confrontational in that way. So my brother got, in, got himself beat up. <laughs> Nothing new. But this time, it was important. I don't know what it was, but um, 
he came to me for help and he was crying. Now this, this was after, this was following this episode with the jail. So I thought, okay, my brother got beat up. <clears throat> what would I normally do? Go find the kid, right? And start another fight. <laughs> the fight had already taken place earlier that day. So I thought, well, okay, the responsible thing to do is to go to my dad and tell him that my brother got beat up and I'm standing there. So just so you know the, the context here, so I'm, I'm my brother's advocate by default. My brother's over here sn sniveling and crying and all this. <clears throat> so my dad had, just to give you the image here, my dad had this, we, have a, we had a small house, and, but he had knocked out the garage wall so he can make the garage part of the living room. So this huge living room, my dad is sitting on one side of it way far back and he was farsighted. So for him, that was perfect. He could watch TV on the other side of the room, which is what he was doing. So my brother and I walked in with my brother crying and I'm going to, you know, be his like what advocate or something and ask my dad for help. Cause I figured that was the right thing to do. <clears throat> so we're walking and my dad is trying to watch TV and he's doing this to look around us and he doesn't care that my brother's crying. So we walk over there. He, he, all the whole time, hardly glanced at us. But anyways, so I go to tell him the story. Joe told me this, <laughs> here's what happened today. So my, my dad's like, <laughs> you know, leaning over to try to get around us. And he's barely, I guess, listening. I'm barely listening. And finally he says, guys, there are two of you. Don't bring me this shit again. There are two of you. You're not wimps. You get into a fight. One of you gets into a fight. You both get into a fight. I don't want to hear this anymore. I'm not going to do anything for you. What, what do you want me to do? You handle it. And I don't care what you have to do. If you have to go in my shed and get two by fours, and go beat somebody's ass. That's what you need to do. But I don't bring this to me. And I don't want. I don't want to hear you crying. And say, oh, somebody beat me up. Handle it. And that's that was his attitude. And it wasn't like he was saying, uh, "Go exact violence on somebody." He was just saying, "Don't be a wimp. Own up to what happened. Maybe you caused it." He didn't even care. It just got me thinking, and it just ne it never it never left me that that experience. And I guess maybe the lesson was. I was looking at it the wrong way because there's a time to fight. There's a time to realize who you're dealing with and, and fight and be effective, be effective. So I, I say that to use the two by fours in the shed as a metaphor for, for what I'm going to tell you. So I wrote this article called impugning the state bar. It's something I had been thinking about for several years, at least, as you know, what I do. And it just, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this in words. So the thing that you don't like, the things that you don't like, okay? The problems that I think I might be able to solve for you, the, the, the reasons why you come to me in many cases, deal with money or property rights or procedures or things of that nature that deal with the legal system. So I've just taken it upon myself to learn what those are and I'll share it with you. And I, and I have strategies, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that's what, that's what advocates do. And that's what I am, I'm an advocate. In that sense, mostly when it comes to property rights and you know legal matters and things of that nature. So I wrote this article explaining that the state bar, think about it. Bar members make all the laws. They let's just say from 1948, and I'm talking about in Florida. This is true in all 50 states. I'm just going to talk about the formation of the Florida bar in the state of Florida. So the bar members organize themselves into a labor union. That's an exclusive club. It's a private membership association. Not a one of them has a state license. There's no public funds that license the competency or permission of any lawyer to practice law, to write the law, to decide on the law, to ram it up your ass. And they've been doing that for decades. And you let them. You let them. You built the box that you're trying to escape from right now. And you're not able to escape easily because you're not being effective. How do you be? How are you going to be effective? Well, realize the nature of the beast. Okay, you've got these lawyers, these pukes, that can't get a job in the real world. Most of them shouldn't even be lawyers. If there's, you know, in the stereotypical idea of a lawyer, should be someone who's knowledgeable of the law and is going to help someone and be his advocate. That's not what's happening. They're just taking your property. Okay. The lawyers are inextricably involved 
in the human trafficking, in the family court system. They're involved in all these financial regulations that when you go to open your account at the bank, the bank asks you for all this nonsense information to investigate your life that would normally be prohibited by the, by the Fourth Amendment, among other things, right to privacy and all this. The lawyers were involved in the phony pandemic. Without the lawyers, you wouldn't have had this crap pushed on you. They've been kicking your ass for a long time and you've been letting them, or you've been ineffectively fighting them. But let's look at what they are. It's a private club. I'm going to call them marauders. They're marauders. They're cohesive. You have to give them credit. They're pervasive. And they use every tool. And they don't use violence, though. They use words. They use intimidation. They use your own fear against you. And yeah, there's some things that there's no fear involved. They just block your access to exercising your rights. They accuse you of money laundering. They act as if you're a threat to national security when you go open a bank account. They make you waive your rights just to access your own money. They hold your money. Just the other day, I sent some money over for something. The damn bank wants to hang on to it for a week. It wasn't a lot of money either. So how are they operating? They have rules. And by the way, the bar members have had every right to form the association, which they now are. They had every right to do that. So you've got this cohesive uniform society, the secret society, really, that's destroyed our court system. We don't have a court anymore, but we have, we have remedies. Sometimes we have lots of remedies outside of the court and this sort of thing. I don't want to get too far into that, but the nature of the beast is that you have this private club that's administering and imposing all these restrictions on the use of your private property, the exercise of your private property rights in many, many aspects. And you'll see, I'm going to explain a couple examples here. It's not just about money and using trust organizations. And it's not just about that. It's about the fact that, that our, we have property rights over the use of money, the, the means of which we use to trade with each other. Okay. And, and these guys have, have been taking it for a long time and among other things. So what I'm suggesting to you is that you understand that the bar does not include any licensed professional, meaning that bar members are not accountable under public funds. They administer and decide their own competency. They're not open to public scrutiny. And they're writing our laws and they're prosecuting us and they're accusing us of being criminals everywhere we go. Everywhere, how many times today were you on camera somewhere? Are you using a phone that's not been de-Googled? Yeah, your phone's under surveillance. Why? Because you're a suspect in a crime that was written by a lawyer, not accountable to the state. It's not using public funds. That role in our society is not licensed. A physician is, a 7-Eleven business owner is, but a lawyer is not. And the lawyer is what makes it all come together. The lawyer is what administers everything that makes it work. You try to buy a business, you can't do it without a lawyer. I mean, you can, but it's very difficult in many cases. So we have this society doing these things to us. And very few of you are actually taking the time to read the rules. I'm talking about rules of court. I'm not saying you have to become a lawyer, but... Uh, Find out what the nature of the beast is. What, what are the details? Um, many of you are accused of violating regulations and statutes. Many of you are treated as if you may in the future <laughs> violate laws and things of that nature. So there's more of us, way more of us that are not lawyers than those who are lawyers. But the lawyers are running away with everything. We're kind of letting them. We're buying into the lies about the use of our money People think a 401k is an investment. They think it's their own investment. You know, on and on and on. So I'm, I'm going to give you a list of some of the tools I've been discussing lately that are designed to defeat this. We can do it. So the example of the bar is that it's a guide. It's a guide that will allow us to regain much of our property rights, regain our role in society, give us some sort of, what do you call it? managerial role. Right now, we're acting like employees and children. We're the one that created this whole system. 
we should act like it. So the, the bar is a great example. So what I'm saying is why not form or act in your own private way? Why not? I mean, look at my, for myself, okay? I insure my own car. That's not the smartest thing ever, but I took it upon myself to, to take on that risk. And I think I can manage it pretty well. It's not the best, but I can do, I can do pretty well. Why? Why would I do that? Because I don't want to deal with the insurance companies. Sometimes I have to, and so far in 30 years, it's been working out pretty good. It's not the best, like I said, but still, I homeschool my children. I'm not saying you guys have to change your lifestyle, but I'm just saying I recognize what they're doing, and so I avoid a lot of that. Now, we can keep on doing that, but let's understand who we're dealing with and that the way they're interacting with us is the exact way we can interact with each other and them. We, the bar had every right to form the, the bar association. Those members had every right to do that. So do we. We can engage in our professions and and use our money. Heck, we have we have the best uh, technology that's ever existed in human history. In fact, the technology that we have access to is military technology. I've been trying to tell this, explain this for decades, not decades. I've been actually let's see, 2009 is when cryptos came out. I didn't really start talking about this until 2013. So yeah, for the last 10 years, I've been explaining cryptography is in our hands. Now AI is also. We can actually write AI modules for ourselves. I don't know if you know that. There's no excuse. We have all this technology and we're still getting our asses kicked. Why? Because we're not working together. We're not going out to that tool shed and getting the two by fours. Okay. And that's metaphorical. I'm not saying use violence or something like that. But you you guys talk to me and I think I think you you want to call me on the phone and, and I enjoy talking to each of you, but you call me on the phone and I, I guess it's for entertainment. It's entertaining. And and yeah, okay. So I like to be entertaining and I like to uh, laugh at things and, and and whatnot, but this is a serious matter. These are the things you, we discuss um, that I discuss with clients in my profession are important. They're the most important things that people have. And so what I'm trying to share with you is that the thing that's kicking our asses is something that we can manage. And we can manage it using the example of the people that are kicking our asses. I gave a presentation recently um, the end of COVID is what they called it. And I was explaining to the physicians how they can organize their own private associations. Now, many of you have come to me and, and asked how you can organize your businesses that way. And many of them, you can organize that way. Um, you can also manage your cash flow in a way that dramatically reduces your tax liability. You don't need permission from anybody. You can just do it. I do it. Many of my clients do it. Um, it's all legal. I like to, I like to follow the law as, as the law appears on the books. There's only one exception though, late, my latest rant on the FinCEN reporting that they proposed for January, okay? But in any case, so let's use the bar as an example. So we we have property rights and they're being used against us. <clears throat> so that's why I came up with the biometric lien on your, uh, the biometric security agreement, okay? The lien on your biographical and biometric data. That's no joke. So. We have this lien, and I know I laugh about it and we have a good time, but this is no joke. This is serious. We put a lien on this. It's a property, okay? Now, some of you are recording it. You're having a difficult time. You'll get past that, okay? The county recorder's office is where we're recording these security agreements. The county recorder's office is a function of your court system. It's your trial court system. The clerk of the court, everything that goes through the clerk of the court may end up, not everything, but the important documents, the the determination documents, okay, the judgments and things of that nature, or agreements or liens, those end up in the county recorder's office, which is a function of the clerk of court. <clears throat> Sometimes it's called the Bureau of Conveyances. So understand that that's going on. And if you're going to record a security agreement and you're having a difficult time, you just find another way to do it. Okay. I gave you a short video the other day. I'm sorry I didn't do a live call on Thursday. That little nine minute video, we'll cover it again. But that's just one small aspect of what I'm talking about here. I gave you another example. Now, many of you may not be dealing with this. I haven't yet reached out to that market, that niche market of people that are dealing with post-nuptial uh, personal relationship type things, long-term relationship type things, post-nuptial, pre-nuptial types of arrangements. But I, I've written something that would divest the state of its ability to interfere in your family. Now, very few of you have asked me, and again, I haven't gone to that niche market, but 
This is another example of how we can use the laws as they are right now to recover privacy and property rights and our proper roles in society and our proper roles when we're serving our families. Okay. So the postnuptial, you saw me, uh, I did a video, I think I, I called it divorcing the state. I did a couple of videos on that. So you've got the article on the bar. Maybe I'll do a video on that, but there's a written article on that. And then you got the security agreements. You guys see how powerful this is. This is this is turning the tide, okay? It'll turn the tables on this system. I hear many of you talking about the central bank digital currency. Let me just run this by you. Now, I was talking to a client the other day and um, I was just needing the some metadata, if you will, some dates or something to prepare uh, some documents for her. And she was telling me about uh, the physical abuse she suffered in the situation and not to be callous, but I, I told her I don't, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. I'm sorry she experienced that, but I'm not, I'm not here to listen to that. I'm not a counselor, but I can help her through a process as an advocate, which is what I'm doing. And I've given her quite an advantage and the state is in, in a tizzy. This is in Indiana. In any case, what I explained to her was that by, by explaining and telling the story of the abuse she suffered, which really, I mean, she, maybe she needs to go through that, right? But for my purposes in helping her, I don't need to hear the story again. But what she's doing is she's reliving it. She's reliving it as the victim. It's okay to go review a, a scenario that happened to you, but you should do it in a, in a healing way in, and as, an, as being empowered, not woe is me, this happened to me. Okay, now she wasn't really crying or anything like that. I'm just saying, I don't think she looked at it that way. So I, I just gave her that little, my two cents worth on that. This is what I want to share with each of you. We're talking about central bank digital currency. See, I said that several times already. And you say it in a way as if it's like the weather that ruins your picnic and you have nothing to do about it. And the more you're talking about it, what you're doing is you're announcing it to each other and you're creating, you're just, you're just, creating acceptance for it just realize that you're 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 educating each other about what this is and possibly that's not what it is but you're telling each other how it's going to do all these things these horrible things to us and again it's the system that is doing it to us and we're just letting it because we think that we're that's our role we're supposed to just accept it and then talk about it and then complain about it and then vote against it and petition against it and it's going to happen anyways and we're not actually being effective we're not being effective okay that's what i'm saying so all I can do is I'm going to give you a couple examples, right? And I've been talking about this stuff. And I think maybe it's important that I have this video because, I, you know, I, I publish things and I talk about them <clears throat> and I really don't paint the picture of what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do. So I see a lot of problems. I see a lot of these, you know, these concerns that people have, John, what happens if this happens? What are you going to do if this happens? Well, you know, I, sometimes I don't care because I already, I'm deciding that I'm going to do a certain thing. I, 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 I'm being, I'm being vague here, but um, stop talking about the central bank digital currency as if it's, you know, unavoidable. I mean, maybe it's not, but you don't have to participate. We have cryptographic currency. We have other means of, of dealing with it. What happens if one day you just can't use cash anymore? That's coming. Well, act like that's today. And I'm talking about credit cards and things of that nature. Okay. It's all included. In other words, you won't have a choice. You have, in order to buy or sell, you have to go along with the system. Okay, that day may be coming. Let's not just lament over it and, and just ex talk as if we're accepting it. Let's find out what the rules are. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples here, more than I've ever talked about. So I just mentioned the postnuptial agreement. The very least, my, my intent on that was to show you how to remove the court from being able to interfere with your children's custody, your marriage, or any separation agreement. If you even have a live-in boyfriend, girlfriend, you can eliminate the court. Don't think that because you're not married, the court can't get involved in your relationship. Because all it takes is somebody to file a petition, and you don't have it prepared, you don't have yourself prepared, and, and you're in court now, okay? And the judge is now telling you what to do. And the judge tells you what to do because the state legislature told him what to tell you to do. You see? Who's in the state legislature? Bar members. Who's the judge? A bar member. What do you go to? Who do you go? Who do you call for help? A bar member. Do you have a chance? 
if you don't understand this. So there's a way to get out from that system. I, I show you that if you look at my video on divorcing the state, I'm telling you what that is. You can run with it. This is you picking that up. This is you and your friends. Don't do this alone. This is you and your friends going out to that shed and getting those two by fours. It's being effective. The security agreement, it's being effective. It doesn't matter if you have difficulty recording it. You'll get it recorded. It's the court. It has to be recorded. I explained in my nine minute video why. We have the easements. I'm all for scrutinizing my work. I wouldn't be able to be effective if you didn't. But let's not let that, let's not allow that to impede you, your use of it. If you think it's just going to cause problems for you, then don't use it. But I know a lot of you out there, more, way more of you are going forward with it than are not. There's just a few of you that are talking yourselves out of this. And that's okay with me. I'm not going to spend a lot of my time arguing with you. Um, I really appreciate if I have made a mistake or an incorrect legal conclusion, I definitely need to be corrected. But as it stands today, I cannot see any reason why uh, using the easement for the way I described is not going to be effective. There are probably going to be those cases where it's not. I'll tell you, um, the, the, one, the thing I came up with way back about 20 years ago where I created a wage garnishment for my client that blocked all the creditors from doing wage garnishments. So I made my client uncollectible with a, the court's own procedure by immunizing my client against future wage garnishments by being the first one. My service was the first method, first, we'll call it, incident where we placed a wage garnishment against my client that blocked everybody else. And of course, we didn't take his wages. We just placed the lien there, right? I only had one time where there, it didn't work. And I'm talking thousands of times. I don't know how many thousands, but one time it didn't work because the people did exactly what I told them not to do. It was a group of people and they were all related and they, they had a special situation. And I told them a specific way to deal with that and they didn't. And the exact thing I told them what happened did happen. And I had to, I still wanted to help them. And so we, we fixed it, but we had, to, it took a lot more work. I'm just saying it was extremely effective. I would say hundred percent. I hate to say hundred percent, but it was hundred percent effective. We blocked all the banks. That's why they attacked me. I'm not going to get into that story. Um, the same thing with the arbitration. I could not do that by myself. I know you, you heard the story. I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell it again real quick. So the banks were putting all this arbitration stuff in the contracts, okay? So I got together with people and I taught them how this is working and I created a business plan for them to go off and do it just like the banks were. It took about 18 months and we shut the banks down because they couldn't challenge us and they couldn't keep on doing what they were doing because we were doing what they were doing against them. Didn't have to go to court, didn't have to argue with anybody and we were effective. I could not have done it. It was my idea, but I could not have done it by myself. I had to be distanced from it because that would make it legal. If it if I didn't distance myself from it, it would have plausibly been illegal, okay? But again, I used tools that we had. I created a system, a method, and solved the problem. How did I do that? I learned the rules. Learned the rules, how things operate, studied, okay? It didn't take long. It took me maybe a few weeks to figure this out. Back then, that was the, the wage garnishment thing and the, and the arbitration, okay? Now we have this easement thing. I think it's vital that we control the land that we're supposed to be using. We lost that control after the Civil War for sure. We lost it in the feudal system that was already there. It had existed for a long time. They just got a better hold on it. They, meaning the financial interests that are not in this country the financial, the foreign financial interests. And that's another thing the bar is being used for. The bar is in our in our financial environment, let's call it, our financial, our life. It's in our lifestyle. It's in our everything we, we need to make our life work, okay? Our lives work. The bar is in it. But the bar is a tool of foreign financial interests. Understand the nature of the beast, okay? The bar is not magical. You can form a bar association yourself. You're not precluded, okay? That's why I wrote the article impugning the state bar. Please get that. If you, if you, please ask me for that. It's free. Check it out. So that's about the easements, security agreement, 
the postnuptial agreement. Then we come into the similar method to handle the property rights. I use the HOA covenant, okay? That deals with the title and all that, as you know. That is just another tool. It, it has different aspects. It can be used for a very similar purpose as the easement, almost the same, okay? It just takes more people. But I'm just saying it goes on and on and on, okay? I, I go, I, I travel around all day and you know, I do things like y'all do. And I see people that are, what are they doing? They're staring at their phone, okay? In the middle of the grocery store, they're blocking the damn aisle with the stupid phone. I feel like slapping them in the head. What's worse is they're doing it in traffic. So the car, go, they start driving more slowly and this is just jamming up. It just, I, I got to stop myself because it's just really infuriating. And I look at these creatures, these people as being owned. They are owned. They're owned. Let's call it by the matrix, okay? They're owned. If you're if you're addicted to your phone and you're using it for everything and shopping and everything, shame on you. You're owned. And this this leads me into something I want to tell you about being owned, okay? So the first thing you can do, if you think to yourself, "Wow, it's too complicated. I don't know what know what John knows." That takes years to figure that out. Not really. I mean, my profession before I did this work was uh, cutting grass. I, I drove my car around my truck and I went and cut grass for a living, <laughs> you know? And then I got a job at computer companies and this sort of thing. And then when I sat in the courtroom to investigate the debt collection system, I realized that these are a bunch of hacks. They really are truly a bunch of hacks, stealing your property. Uh, and it just made me angry. And I decided that I was gonna learn what they were doing and reverse engineer it and tell everybody. And that's what I did. And it went from there. So you are owned if you're addicted to this technology and you're letting it rule your life. This technology should set us free. It is a military technology. We can use it for anything we want. Are you tired of the Securities and Exchange Commission dictating how you're going to use cryptos? Go on the dark web. Who's using the dark web? Your bank? Probably the biggest terrorist, terrorist organization network in human history is the bank, the banking system, and your government. Who else is using the dark web? Your government? Your government created it in 1943. The U.S. military created the internet in 1943, I believe it was, at Berkeley, California at Berkeley. They called a computer and they called another computer. They had three computers talking to each other, and that was the internet. 1943, I bet you didn't even know that. We didn't have browsers until 1997, I believe. So in any case, browsers, you know, it gives you all the pictures. You can just click on the picture. I remember logging into the internet in the 90s with a blinking cursor. That's all you got. So you have to know what you're doing, right? So you are owned if you are using your phone for anything other than, if you're using it for shopping, downloading apps because you're getting bonuses and coupons and discounts, shame on you. You should not be doing that. Maybe your thinking is, ah, well, you can't stop the technology. Okay, why not use a dedicated phone that just does that and then use another phone that has private conversations, a de-Googled phone that has actual private conversations, and then use your other phone that has no uh, privacy protections to get all the other benefits and goodies that you want. Okay, think about that. Just think about that. See, there, there's a sim very simple solution, okay? You don't have to go hide in the corner somewhere or go live in the forest and uh, you know forage for food. <laughs> we can use technology. Look, I don't use an SSN for anything. I don't file tax returns. I have credit cards. I have bank accounts. I can do whatever I want, except with some exception, okay? I can't walk into a bank and get a mortgage like most of y'all. Or if I, if I did, <clears throat> it, would, it would be a little bit more difficult. But anyways, um, so, so you are owned if you're using this technology or you're allowing it to use you. That's probably the better way to say it. This leads into the thing I'm, I want to tell you that goes along with that. Look at your health. If you're out of shape and you're, you're eating food that's you know, processed foods and has all these chemicals in it and you're not paying attention and you're trying to be a vegetarian because it sounds trendy, uh, you need to go back to traditional diets. Go back to the 50s and find out what people lived on. Mostly it was, it was farm products, okay? It was beef and butter. It really was. That's going to make you the healthiest. Of course, you can look at me as saying, that. okay, that's my opinion. We'll go look at people in the 50s. Go on YouTube and go look at videos 
of people from the 50s and the 70s and go look around in your, in your grocery store in your neighborhood today. And you tell me who had the better diets. So you're being owned if you're out of shape, especially if you're obese. You're, you're being owned if, you have, if you're on pharmaceuticals. You guys already probably know this. You're being owned if you're using the technology or letting it use you. You should be using the technology to enrich your life. Number one, I show people how to use the technology. The other day, I did a podcast with uh, VJ on Rogue News. We did a, we did a video, it's paid for podcast. In fact, I'm gonna give you guys the link. If you, I would hope that you wanna see this. I was showing you how to use technology. In fact, I showed in the video how to use AI to create a business plan to make money. And I just showed you a, a brick and mortar business. I don't even like those. You could do this on the internet. You don't need AI, but I'm just saying, the technology is right there. Why are you not using it? You got the damn phone in your in your hand all day long. You're staring at it. I know you are. I'm going to tell you something. Somebody, a local client, introduced me to TikTok the other day, and she was showing me something. So I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create an idea on TikTok. So I did. You guys don't. I'm not going to tell you what my idea is. So I created the idea on TikTok, and lo and behold, somehow it connected my phone number to many of you <laughs> that are my clients. <laughs> to follow or to connect with, right? You might know this person. You might know this person. I'm looking down the list. I'm like, hey, those are all my clients. I'm like, whoa, you guys have been on TikTok for a long time. Hey, I think you're being owned. It's okay to use the technology, but make it serve you, okay? If you're out of shape, get it, get into a weight training program. Get into some sort of program where you're gonna have physical, physical fitness. Stop eating crap. Eat, drink clean water. Have a regular routine, right? Fasting maybe. Stop with the technology on everything. Stop getting smart meters and uh, smart refrigerators and all this nonsense, okay? Just think of it like that. I, I'm probably getting off uh, on uh, to a subject I don't want to, but we're allowing this technology to own us. We're allowing these pukes in the bar to reach into our lives, reach into our homes and, and decide for us what resources we can have and the way we can have them. And it's going to get worse. It's just going to get worse until we until we realize what we're dealing with. We have to put some words on it. We have to explain and talk to, and don't be alone. Talk to people. I, I Invariably, if you call me with a consultation and you need to talk about something important, many times I will introduce you to some of my partners, or I'll introduce you to another professional that I respect, or that may have some information that's beyond what I could give you. Okay. I'm, you've probably experienced that. You cannot do things that are so important by yourself. You have to use your family, your friends, and other professionals. And luckily I have access to some of those. And so you have access to me and you know we can do these things. In fact, I've been really uh, enriched in my profession because I know people like yourselves and you guys connect me to really cool other people and things. So know that you are not alone, but don't, and don't act like you're alone. Don't, don't go into this by yourself, okay? Don't worship a document. If you have a document, like for example, um, people do this all the time they'll have a trust document and they think it's the, the thing. If I have this trust document, my life is way better. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to be diligent in your life. You have to have a use for it. You have to identify the purpose for which you have that document. Um, so I'm just saying, look at what I'm publishing. I'm just one person with some ideas. Um, I feel like Many of those ideas come from where I've been effective at solving other people's problems. I can't get into every little possible scenario, but I can tell you this. If you come to me with a, a situation, and many of them are common, but they're in different states, and I've never heard of that situation, and I've had a lot of cases like this, and, and it's in a different state. I'm familiar with some states way more than I am other states. It doesn't intimidate me. Um, I'm familiar with legal procedures in some areas more than I am in others but it wouldn't bother me at all to look up uh, a procedure, a regulatory procedure that has to do with OSHA in another state. I've never done that, but I'll do it. And I take that back because I have done it, but I'm just saying in the last couple of years, it was new to me a few years ago. Let me, let me share another idea with you. So I ran this by my team the other day and we were just, just talking about this. And if you look at the Department of Health, that was the Department of Health's mission statement, right? Is to what make sure everyone's healthy. They're going to fight obesity and heart disease and all this nonsense, right? But look around. 
People are fatter than ever. They're on more drugs than ever. They're having more medical care needs than ever. The insurance rates are nuts. People are going into these really bad habits of relying on corporations for their health. It's ridiculous. Go back to 1950. Look what people did. Go back to 1940. Look what people did. Okay. So what do you do? Do you sue the Department of Health for what? Well, the Department of Health says or acts as if it has a mandate to ensure the health of, it, of people in, in the community. So let's just say your county Department of Health or your state Department of Health. I'm not even talking about the, the Fed, just, just your local, okay? So what I would suggest this to you. So this is one thing to look at with the Department of Health. Think of this as a template that you can use with other problems or scenarios. So the Department of Health has gotten more and more and more money over the years, billions of dollars. I think I just read the other day, got a, a budget approval by our governor here for $49 billion and people are sicker than ever. Where's the Department of Health? There is no health. It's just, they're getting money to what? Make people, they, they gotta take some responsibility. I mean, we have to take responsibility too for our own lives, but if we're giving public funds to the Department of Health and everybody's sicker than ever, what does that tell you? Stop giving them more public funds. How do you do that? How does the Department of Health get its money? It writes a budget, applies to whoever, I don't know, maybe the state legislature, I'll figure it out. You guys figure it out for your state. The Department of Health gets budget approval before it can spend any money. Jam it up. Jam up the budget approval process for your Department of Health. Write up a document, and I'm going to show you one I'm working on right now. Write up a public document. This is not a legal process at all. This is not a petition. Write up a document that's called a vote of no confidence and a vote for defunding your Department of Health because it's failed. Look at your statistics. You cannot argue with the statistics because where do they come from? The Department of Health and other government agencies. Use those numbers to show how your Department of Health shouldn't get one damn dime from you ever again. Vote them out by cutting the budget. Attack the budget approval process. Um, just jam that up, okay? That's what I'm saying. But write a document going through all the, look at all the health consequences that we're seeing right now. The, the obesity is exploding, heart disease exploding, all kinds of problems, drug use, okay? Look at infant mortality, it's probably up, okay? So, this is just one thing you guys can just pick a fight, man. Pick a fight and look at the numbers and find out where the Achilles heel is. The Achilles heel for your Department of Health, if you want to go after that one, is going to be the budget approval process. You need to jam that up. Find out what the process is. Is there public approval? Is there public debate when the budget is proposed? Is there a chance for public debate? If there's not, make sure there is. That's where you start. <laughs> Get your foot in the door, okay? Get that public debate in your budget approval process for your Department of Health. You might have to use a lawsuit for that. You might have to get injunctive relief for something. You could probably do that. Maybe not. Maybe, don't, maybe you don't need it. But I'm just saying, think this stuff through. Department of Education. Our children are less educated than they've ever been. How do we figure this out? I don't know. We can, we can look at statistics. I haven't even looked at this. Defund your Department of Education. Defund it. Write it like you would write a petition or a survey, write it, write a notice and call it a vote of no confidence for your Department of Education and so forth and so on. Child Protective Services. Let me explain this thing to you. So I had a scenario with those idiots a couple of 15 years ago and I looked at their stats before I took them apart. <laughs> I looked at their stats and I found that out of all the cases that are referred to the or that are reviewed by the Child Protective Services, I forget what they call it here. Um, 5% warrant intrusion by the state. Do you think that 5% is actually what's happening? No, it's almost 100%. Whatever the state can get its little sticky fingers into, it's going to. Anything that comes before the court and family court, if the family court can somehow get away into the family and the children, it's going to do that. You guys know this. So, but 5% justifiably involve the protective service because they're actually going to protect a child and they actually protect a child, let's just say. I think they're involved in human trafficking. I think also that your lawyers maybe unwittingly are involved in it. 
because if you're going to commit a crime, let's say I'm going to commit a crime and it needs, it needs a series of events to take place. And I can commit the crime if I have eight things happen. And I have a person do each of those things that doesn't know anything about the other seven. I can commit the crime, couldn't I? Probably. I know that's hypothetical. Sounds like a making of a movie, right? But think about it. This is what your lawyers are involved in. See, they're the, they're the grease in this machine, okay? Without the lawyer, everything stops, okay? That's why when I took on these foreclosure cases, I took on about 1,000 or so, 11, 1,200, something like that, uh, over a period of a few years. And I didn't, the, 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 the lost note garbage that you guys heard about, you know, you don't have the note, that sort of thing. The way I attacked that is I sued the lawyers and the law firm for identity theft which then required them to prove that they had the chain of custody for the note, which they could never do. So that caused the lawyers to stop all their foreclosures until they had to deal with their own liability first. You see how that works? I, I didn't try to challenge them on the merits unless I had to, sometimes I had to. But at this, if I did, at the same time, I was challenging the lawyers and I was accusing them of identity theft. And it's so easy to do because the, the way that they handle the paperwork and the notices they give out to, to try to justify what they're doing, the foreclosures, it does look like identity theft. It's, it's indistinguishable. So it's very easy for me to say identity theft. And I can easy, ma easily make a case. And what I was doing is I would make a case under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and I would say that it's an unfair, unfair collection practice involving identity theft. I wouldn't sue them for identity theft. I would sue them for FDCPA violations. <laughs> you see? So... I didn't even have to get to the merits. It was funny because I didn't even expect it would work so well. I would sue him. And because that the lawyer's name is on the line now, because it's it's threatening his profession, everything stopped and he had to deal with that. And it took him years. And by that time, my client, mostly my client got his money back because he didn't pay the mortgage, the property tax, or the insurance on the property. He didn't have to do any of that stuff for two, three years. And most of the, most of the clients got their money back. And then I showed him how to get the next house. With bad credit, you know. So I'm just saying there are there are ways to do things. So so first you have to be specific about what the problem, what is the problem? What are the facts? What are you dealing with? Who's involved? What is the weak point? What's the weak link? Where is that Achilles heel? Okay. This postnuptial agreement, I just love this example because divesting the court was so simple. It takes one sentence to divest the court. That's how powerful this is. You have rights. You're not exercising them. In one sentence, I can defeat the entire legislature and the entire trial court system in a divorce proceeding. One sentence. I'm not going to tell you even what that is. Some of you know. And so I go and I make an elaborate postnuptial, prenuptial agreement. Maybe there's never going to be a divorce or separation. I don't care. I'm divorcing the state. I'm showing the family how to divorce the state. Because the state's always going to take uh, make a claim on your on your family. It will always make a claim, whether or not you have a marriage license or not. So, I just wanted to to share that with you. Um, I, I think maybe that's uh, enough information. I'm going to put this on YouTube. I want everyone to hear this. Pass it around. There's some tools out there. Okay, if you don't, if you think you don't have a tool for something, a problem or situation you're facing, or you're just fed up with the banking system or something. Think it through. Um, I mean, I still use the banking system. There's going to be a day where we're just going to have to go on the dark web, guys. We're going to have to use cryptocurrency. We're going to have to have a trading board so we can exchange dollars for, you know, whatever their CBDC nonsense is, possibly. <clears throat> and I believe I'm seeing or you're witnessing a bifurcation of our society. So there's all these things going on. But um, look, don't let these pukes interfere with your life. They have no interest in your life bad or good. And for that reason alone, why are we letting them in? We should not be doing that. We should not be letting them in. But why? We're not paying attention. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to direct your attention to the fact that it's the lawyers. <laughs> and I know it's not that simplistic. I know. You can't just blame a thing <clears throat> as being the only problem in your life. Okay. But, but it is a big one. As you know, lawyers, bar members are are pervasive. They're in every aspect of our society. They write themselves into our contracts. If you see attorney fees in a contract, freaking line it out. They don't get a blank check just because they're freaking bar members, okay? Put a line there and say, no, you don't get attorney fees. In fact, 
if nobody has, think about this, if nobody has attorney fees and contracts, does that discourage litigation? You bet it does. You bet it does. Imagine that if we just took out attorney fees from all the contracts we're involved in, what incentive would there be to get a lawyer involved? No, because each party has to take on the, the cost of whatever, even if he hires an attorney. No one's guaranteed, even if he wins, to get recover his attorney fees. I mean, you're not really guaranteed anyways, <clears throat> but still, the incentive is not there. I'm at, go, try to go to a lawyer on a contract that you need help on, and there's no provision for attorney fees. You think he's going to take that case, or if he does, the retainer is going to be exceedingly high, right? This is really powerful to understand these basic, basic things. <clears throat> so I don't know what else I can add to that. But um, think it through. Ask me for this impugning the state bar. It is a very uh, concise guide. When you see what the bar has done, you'll understand, hopefully, that you can do the same thing. Now, let me just make a comment on the <clears throat> the bar has a private association. No one has any licensing. So there's no public funds involved with the policing of the bar. Every other profession is. Every other profession is, is policed by a state agency because of the licensing, but not lawyers. So use that as a guide, okay? Um, imputing the state bar is the article. Uh, let's see, I was going to say, um, yeah, so there's no, they're not accountable to the public, right? Nor should you be. If you're if you're running a, a profession, if you're managing a profession, many of you have already set up this way. I'm, I'm glad to say, um, dentist office, gyms, all kinds of professional service organizations. I've set them up as PMAs, and they were mostly <clears throat> they were PMAs mostly. Anyways, all I did was give them a few rules to follow. Maybe I modified some of their documents. A PMA is not a document. Okay, a PMA, a PMA exists, and a written document may describe how it operates. That's how you want to look at it. Um, but yeah, look at look at how this plays out, okay? How these lawyers are so pervasive. They're in every aspect of our lives, and we need to be aware of that and exclude them. The postnuptial agreement does exclude them. I, I could probably even do a better job of that now that I'm thinking about it. So the one thing I want to mention about the state bar, so there's a um, – so they form the state bar – then the lawyers who are now part of the bar, there was no other pr legal professional in the state legislature in Florida, for example. Uh, once the bar was formed, everybody who was practicing law that was a legislator, pretty much many of them were lawyers. And so they were bar members. Well, how convenient now, because then they wrote a law that criminalized non-membership in the bar. They didn't criminalize Competence, incompetency in practicing law, they criminalized non-membership. So here's how that works. You can't impose criminal penalties on someone who's practicing law be just because he's not a bar member. Moreover, you couldn't even impose criminal penalties or any type of civil penalties on somebody other than like a consumer fraud type thing if he's incompetent because that person, that person excludes himself from the industry. Right? Who's going to hire an incompetent one? He's going to have a bad reputation, this sort of thing. So it's self-policing in that sense. Um, but, the, but there are criminal penalties for what is known as the, or called the unauthorized practice of law. And so in my article, I explain that this, there is no such thing as the unauthorized practice of law, except within the ecclesiastical form or society known as the Bar Association and the court. These are ecclesiastical societies or associations. These are churches. It's a church. Yes. Just like the NFL is a church. <laughs> the National Football League. Ta-da! You know, bet you didn't know that. So the state bar and the court system is a church. And um, so they impose criminal penalties for what's known as the unauthorized practice of law. So what they want to do is find the individual professional who's being an advocate for someone, practicing law, and they want to impose criminal penalties on him. Well, there's no problem with the unauthorized practice of law, fiction, uh, imposing criminal penalties on corporations. They don't have the right to practice law. Corporations don't have the right to do that. It's so funny when I see a legal document, a pleading in, in a court in someone's case where the law firm makes an appearance by filing a notice of appearance. 
in the notice of appearance is introducing the law firm as the representative of the party. And I quickly file a motion to strike and say, that's the unauthorized practice of law. And you see how fast they fix their documents. So the unauthorized practice of law criminal penalties apply to, ironically, law firms. Law firms cannot practice law. That's why when I see a debt collection notice, the first thing I look for is I want to see how they're representing their law, their law firm, the name of the law firm, because many times they're involved in the unauthorized practice of law by their own rules. I'm not. You can't impose that rule on me. I'm a human being. I'm a professional. You can impose that rule on a licensed professional. I don't have a license to do what I do. I don't need a license. But a CPA, he may have a license to be an accountant or a, some, sort of, some sort of certification for competency to be a public accountant of some kind, okay? That person can be accused of and convicted of the unauthorized practice of law because he's involved in that capacity as a licensed professional in a completely different business, profession, okay? He has no business, no right, no capacity under his licensing for a CPA to give legal advice. Now he could probably give legal advice, but not in the capacity as a CPA. You see how this works? The same with corporations, title companies, limited liability companies, professional associations, professional limited liability companies. Okay, you've seen this all before, PA next to somebody's name, right? Lawyer's name, PA. Well, that's a professional association. That organization, that association can be involved in the unauthorized practice of law. An example of that would be as if he's disbarred, right? And he's still doing it. So, but we see routinely corporations now are acting as if they had the legal right to give legal advice, but yet they want to punish people that are not members of their association, not for being incompetent, just non-membership. They're policing non-membership. So you'll see this in my article. Uh, it's a 13 page. It's a quite lengthy article. I go through and tear, just tear them apart, just tear them apart. And in the end, my recommendation is we don't need to get rid of the bar. We don't need to change the criminal penalties. Just don't apply them to me and get out of my life. Now, they're not going to do that. Why? They have too much power. That's up to us. And that's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm doing this video. All right, enough of that. So I hope that gives you something to think about. I hope I see lots of requests for that article. Again, I'm not just making fun of the bar. I want to show you the anatomy of how that works and that we can do the same thing, okay? They took that power. They had every right to do it. They're using that power against us. Nothing precludes us except our lack of doing it lack of knowledge, nothing precludes us from gaining the same power and recovering our rights. Okay. The constitution is not going to do it magically. You have to do it. Just like, for example, if you go to an IRS audit, bring a damn court reporter and take the transcript, spend the money on the court reporting service, go to the, go to the audit, give them one meeting in person. One, that's all they get. Take the transcript. Don't go back. Let them do their findings. This is how you deal with the IRS, okay? I'm sure I can give you a hundred other examples. <laughs> so I hope you hope you appreciate the story there, the couple of stories. Um, but use that as a metaphor. Go to that woodshed, get out some two by fours, get some friends, and take care of some business, okay? It's your life. It's your property rights. Don't act like the victim. And don't be concerned about the consequences. This is the this is the last thing I'm going to tell you guys. When you do these things, when you carry out these things, these measures that are for your own benefit, for the benefit of your family, for the exercise of your rights, there's a couple things going on. So your immediate family and friends are, you know, hopefully benefiting from what you do. And so would be the people coming after you, your progeny, your children. You want to set an example for them. This is how we do things. Where do you think we get examples from today? The people before us, right? So. Take these actions without fear or concern for the consequences. Just do the thing that you think is going to be effective. Don't break the law. Do the thing that you think is going to be effective, okay? Don't be concerned about the consequences. That's the biggest problem I have with explaining. It's like the, the, the thing with the easements. Y'all are concerned, not y'all, but some of you are overly concerned about the consequences and they're all hypothetical and speculative. You have no idea if that any of those crazy scenarios are ever going to happen. And maybe you're dead on 100% right. So what? It hasn't happened yet. So do you want to use the tool or not? What are you afraid of? You want to keep on living your life the way it is and then complaining? Fine, don't call me, right? So 
take these actions, be bold, follow the laws, okay, be fair to people, and don't be concerned about the consequences. It's important to maybe be pragmatic and understand what they what they could be, but don't let that inhibit you from claiming your rights, exercising your rights, and taking your taking your stuff back. Have some dignity, right? It's dignity. Part of exercising our rights is the reclaiming of our dignity. Okay, all right. Enjoy your weekend, y'all. Hope to see you this week.